Saul of Tarsus, born around the year 10 after Christ's birth, hailed from Tarsus, the capital of the Roman province of Cilicia, located in modern-day Turkey. From a young age, he belonged to the tribe of Benjamin and in his early years became a fervent opponent of Christianity, passionately dedicating himself to the persecution of followers of this emerging faith. His zeal in suppressing the Christian movement was notorious, leading to arrests and contributing to the suffering of the early Christians. However, Saul's trajectory underwent an extraordinary turnaround that redefined his role in Christian history. The crucial turning point occurred in a miraculous and divine encounter with Jesus. During a journey to persecute Christ's followers in Damascus, Saul was confronted by a bright celestial light that left him blind. In that moment, a voice resonated asking, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This revelation not only left Saul astonished, but also radically transformed his perspective and his life. At that instant, Saul, now blind and bewildered, realized the magnitude of the encounter he was experiencing. The impact of the revelation of Christ was profound and immediate. Saul, now aware of his spiritual blindness, recognized the authority of Jesus and in humility asked, Lord, what do you want me to do? This moment represents a radical transformation in Saul's life, a turning point in his journey and life purpose. Jesus instructed Saul to enter the city of Damascus, where he would receive further guidance. However, Saul's physical blindness now symbolized the opening of his spiritual eyes to the reality of the gospel he had previously rejected. Unable to see physically, Saul was led by his companions to Damascus. The experience on the road to Damascus was not merely a divine intervention. It was the foundation of a new identity for Saul. In that instant, he understood the divinity of Jesus, recognizing him as the long-awaited Messiah. Meanwhile, in the city, a disciple named Ananias received a vision from the Lord, instructing him to go to Saul and lay hands on him to restore his sight. Initially, Ananias hesitated, fearing Saul's reputation as a persecutor of Christians. However, God assured Ananias of the miraculous transformation that had occurred in Saul's life and the vital role he would play in spreading the gospel. Ananias obeyed the divine guidance and found Saul in a house in Damascus. By laying hands on him, something extraordinary happened. As scales fell from Saul's eyes, his vision was completely restored. This physical event symbolized the removal of the spiritual scales that had clouded his understanding of the truth. Upon regaining sight, Saul not only became a follower of Jesus, but also was baptized, marking his public identification with the message he once persecuted. Immersed in the experience of transformative grace, Saul, now called Paul, immediately began proclaiming in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God, surprising those who knew his previous reputation. A tireless and passionate man for Christianity, Paul embarked on extraordinary missionary journeys known throughout Christian history. His travels extended beyond geographical borders, reflecting a fervent commitment to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. From the bustling streets of Antioch, to iconic cities like Athens and Corinth, Paul faced challenges, persecutions and hostilities to share the transformative message of the gospel. Paul was not just a wandering preacher, he was a community builder. His letters reveal a deep pastoral zeal as he guided and strengthened the Christian communities that sprouted wherever he went. In Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus and other cities, Paul not only preached, but also invested time in teaching, disciplining, and nurturing new converts. The apostle did not settle for merely spreading the good news. He was an architect of Christian theology. His epistles, which constitute a significant portion of the New Testament, are treasures of theological wisdom, addressing crucial matters of faith, morality, and Christian life. Amidst challenges, Paul persevered, facing imprisonments, floggings, and rejections. His dedication to the cause of Christ was evident in his actions and personal sacrifices. 
In the context of persecutions, a prophet emerges with a compelling vision that would change the course of history. Agabo's prophecy about the imminent challenges awaiting the Apostle Paul is recorded in the book of Acts chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. Agabo, a prophet, comes to Paul in Caesarea to convey a message from the Holy Spirit. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. This prophecy was a clear warning about the dangers Paul would face in Jerusalem. Agabo's symbolic gesture of using Paul's belt to bind his own hands and feet emphasized the inevitability and restrictive nature of the challenges awaiting Paul. The prophet warned that he would be arrested by the Jews in Jerusalem and delivered into the hands of the Gentiles, indicating an impending period of suffering and persecution. Faced with this revelation, it is remarkable to observe the reaction of Paul's close friends who implore him to avoid Jerusalem, fearing the foretold consequences. Despite receiving this prophecy, Paul was determined to proceed, demonstrating his courage and commitment to the call he felt from the Lord. Even aware of the challenges that lie ahead, he maintains an unwavering determination to follow the divine calling. This prophecy served as spiritual preparation and a reminder that the path ahead would be difficult, but Paul was willing to face the challenges in the name of his faith. Thus, he continued on toward Jerusalem, convinced that he was aligned with the divine purpose for his life. Upon arriving in Jerusalem, Paul was welcomed by the brethren in faith. However, events soon unfolded according to Agabo's prophecy. The Jews in Jerusalem, influenced by a false accusation that Paul was preaching against the law and the temple, caused turmoil and assaults against him. The Jews, especially the religious leaders, claimed that Paul was going against Jewish tradition and disrespecting central elements of the Jewish faith. Paul taught that salvation came through faith in Christ, not through works of the law. He argued that converted Gentiles didn't need to follow all the practices and rituals of Jewish law, such as circumcision and dietary laws. This theological approach by Paul sparked controversies and resistance among some more conservative groups within the Jewish community who strongly valued strict observance of Jewish laws. The situation became so volatile that Roman authorities intervened to transfer Paul to Caesarea, a coastal city that would serve as the venue for his trial before Governor Felix. Paul's trial in Caesarea before Governor Felix stands out for the lack of substantial evidence justifying his arrest. Felix, upon hearing the accusations and arguments, acknowledges the lack of justification but keeps Paul under arrest, even without a formal conviction. During this time, Paul continues to preach the Christian message, including sharing the hope of resurrection. After a series of hearings and appeals, Paul remained detained for two years in Caesarea, facing unfounded charges. With the succession of governors, Paul is again called to defend himself before Festus, Felix's successor. Once again, the charges against Paul prove to be baseless, and he expresses his desire to appeal to Caesar, exercising his right as a Roman citizen. This decision led him to Rome, where he would face his final trial before Emperor Nero. The journey to Rome was filled with challenges, including a shipwreck during his voyage. The story of Paul's shipwreck on the island of Malta is an exciting episode narrated in the book of Acts, chapters 27 and 28. At that moment, Paul was on his way to Rome as a prisoner, along with other travelers, including the centurion Julius, responsible for his custody. The journey began under unfavorable conditions, and Paul, with his spiritual intuition, warned about imminent dangers. However, his advice was disregarded. As they sailed through the Adriatic Sea, a fierce storm hit the ship. The situation became increasingly critical, and the crew lost hope of surviving. Amidst the storm, Paul received a message from God through an angel, assuring him that everyone on board would survive, but the ship 
would be destroyed. He shared this revelation with the crew, offering them hope and encouraging them to stay on board to ensure everyone's safety. The ship eventually ran aground on a sandbank, but fulfilling the divine promise, everyone safely reached the island of Malta. The local population, noticing the condition of the shipwreck survivors, showed generosity by lighting a fire for them to warm up. While Paul was helping gather firewood, a venomous snake came out of the fire and bit him. Surprisingly, he suffered no harm, leading the locals to consider him a god. This incident opened doors for Paul to share the gospel in Malta, where he also performed healings and miracles. After three months, Paul and his companions boarded an Alexandrian ship that had wintered on the island, continuing their journey towards Rome. The journey continues, and Paul finally arrives in Rome. His arrival is not marked by grand celebrations, but by the continuation of his mission even under house arrest. Under the watch of a Roman soldier, Paul receives permission to preach and teach. He summons Jewish leaders to share the message of Christ, with some responding positively while others resist. The period in Rome serves as an epilogue in Paul's journey, where he continues to impact lives even while facing the prospect of death. The book of Acts concludes with Paul residing in Rome, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ openly and without hindrance. His situation in the capital of the Roman Empire did not hinder his missionary zeal. He was granted the freedom to receive visitors. During this phase, Paul also continued to write letters, including some of the so-called prison letters, such as Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. These letters reflect his deep theology and wisdom, conveying encouragement, pastoral instructions, and teachings about the nature of Christ and Christianity. The second epistle to Timothy, often considered one of Paul's last letters, is especially emotional and reflective. In it, Paul expresses awareness that his life is coming to an end. He mentions his struggles, perseverance, and faithfulness to the gospel despite difficulties. Paul shares meaningful words, stating that he is already being poured out as a drink offering and that the time of his departure has come. However, instead of lamenting, Paul declares that he has fought the good fight and kept the faith. His language suggests a sense of accomplishment and inner peace in the face of the inevitable. In one of his most memorable statements, recorded in the second book of Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, Paul shares his perspective on life's tribulations. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. These words indicate that Paul understood adversities as temporary compared to the eternal glory awaiting believers. His expectation of eternal life was grounded in the conviction of resurrection and the redeeming work of Christ. Sometime later, in the year 64 AD, a great fire devastated the city of Rome during the reign of Emperor Nero. The flames consumed vast areas, resulting in significant losses and leaving a large part of the population homeless. The exact cause of the fire remains uncertain, but some historical sources suggest that Nero himself might have been involved. It is known that Nero had ambitions to rebuild parts of the city according to his grand architectural projects. The fire would provide an opportunity for him to redesign and remodel the city according to his desires. This reconstruction could increase his popularity among the Roman population. Some ancient sources, like the Roman historian Tacitus, suggest that Nero played his lyre and sang poems while watching the fire. These controversial accounts fueled the idea that Nero had some responsibility for the disaster. However, Emperor Nero faced a challenge in dealing with public discontent amid the devastation. In an attempt to deflect blame from himself, Nero turned to an already marginalized community in Rome, the Christians. The Christian faith was viewed with suspicion by Roman authorities, and followers of Jesus were often misunderstood. 
Nero initiated a persecution campaign against the Christians, unjustly accusing them of being responsible for the fire. Many historians consider this persecution an attempt to divert public attention from his possible involvement in the fire and consolidate his power. Christians became convenient scapegoats amid the chaos. During the persecution unleashed by Nero, several followers of Christianity were subjected to imprisonments, tortures and various forms of death. Some faced crucifixion, others were thrown into arenas to serve as food for wild animals. Some were used as human torches to illuminate the night in the city, while others met their end through beheading. Finally, in the year 67 AD, Paul was arrested and imprisoned once again. However, unlike previous imprisonments, Paul already felt that he would not escape with his life this time. His conviction rested on the certainty of having fought the good fight, completed his journey, and preserved the faith as written in Timothy. According to Christian tradition, Nero sentenced Paul to capital punishment, being beheaded on the roadside from Rome to Ostia. This choice of execution was evidently related to Paul also being a Roman citizen. Otherwise, his death might have taken more cruel and humiliating forms. For example, the same tradition reports that Peter, a contemporary of Paul, also detained during that period, was crucified upside down in Nero's circus. The lasting legacy of the Apostle Paul serves as an invitation to reflection and action. As we contemplate Paul's example of faith and commitment, we are challenged to reflect on our own spiritual journey. His willingness to face adversity, endure persecution, and maintain unwavering faith even in the face of death serves as a guiding light, leading us in our own paths of faith. Paul not only proclaimed the message of the gospel, but lived it with fervor and conviction, a vivid testimony that resonates beyond the boundaries of time. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey through the life of the Apostle Paul. We hope you found inspiration in his unwavering faith and commitment. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel for more content, and don't forget to leave your thoughts and comments below. Your support means the world to us, and we look forward to exploring more stories and teachings together. Until next time, may you find strength and encouragement in your own spiritual journey. Thank you, and God bless.